Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our third Homeless and Housing Resource Center SNOPO Learning Community. Really happy uh, folks are back joining us. Um, this is session three of four. And today, um, I'll start off with just reminding everyone uh, of this disclaimer that the Homeless and Housing Resource Center is a program operated by the Policy Research Inc. and developed under this grant number from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And interviews, policies, and opinions expressed are those of the authors or presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of SAMHSA or HHS. Today we have ASL interpretation and transcription available. Uh, we've arranged for ASL interpretation services during this meeting. And today we'd like to welcome our interpreters, Pamela Mitchell and Dave Kratzer. Um, there's live transcription available. Just click the live transcript CC and then select show subtitles. If you're having any technical difficulties, please just email this email address and we'll ask our, um, our colleagues to put that in the chat in the event that you need it. Okay, so session three. So just as a quick refresher, in session one, we did kind of um, uh, an, uh, an overview and presentation of some of the best uh, practice and principles of doing this work in your community, serving people who are experiencing homelessness, who are unsheltered, uh, people who are homeless in rural areas, um, and centering principles of practice that are really important to doing this work. And in session two, we talked about all the different systems that uh, your COCs will and your uh, provider agencies ideally will partner with in order to really serve the whole person, right? We know that our, our selves as a grantee, we know that you all are all the special NOFO awardees, that you may do pieces of service. You might be doing the housing of individuals. You might do some supportive housing navigation but you're not necessarily delivering all of the other services that are required in order to make sure that people are being comprehensively served. Um, and so we focused on that last time we did, we shared with you all some resource mapping tools and crosswalking. And then we talked about how excited that we were today that we get to bring actual organizations to this presentation who get to talk with you all about all the incredible work that they have done to really create a comprehensive continuum around the people that they are serving in partnership. And so that is what we will be focusing on today. So we've got two presenters, actually three, um, but two organizations. So we've got Recovery Works from Colorado, and we also have Aspire in Indiana. And then we'll be doing panel discussion and questions. And so folks can use the Q&A uh, to submit questions throughout the presentations. We may hold off on answering those until we get to the end of the second presentation. So with that, I am very excited to get to introduce James Ginsburg, who's the Executive Director of Recovery Works in Colorado. James is the founder Executive Director of Recovery Works, a Colorado nonprofit organization serving unhoused persons in Jefferson County. He's the former Deputy Director of Housing Stability and Homeless Resolution for the City of Denver, where he oversaw the city's response to sheltered and unsheltered homelessness and housing instability during the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Ginsburg has been working with unhoused persons for over 25 years, including 18 years with the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, where he oversaw multiple housing, case management, and recovery programs. He's the founder and former director of the Fort Lyon Supportive Residential Community, the largest recovery program for persons experiencing homelessness in Colorado. And he is a certified addiction counselor three and holds a master's degree in nonprofit management. James, thank you so much for being here today and I'll turn it over to you now. 
Yeah, thank you, Rachel. And uh, it's great to be here and welcome everyone. Um, I'm just honored to talk about this topic of partnerships. And I was right before this meeting, we had just started. Um, I, we, I run a navigation center as part of our programming um, where folks, you know, it's very low barrier and um, it's on a street called Colfax in Denver, which is sort of ground zero for um, a lot of things, um, including uh, a lot of where our, our unhoused neighbors live. And, and one of the things I'm trying to start is kind of an early uh, recovery group, introduction to recovery, um, loosely based on 12-step recovery, but trying to engage people. And we haven't been in, having anybody um, drop in yet, um, but I have a, a partnership with um, a member of the 12-step community externally, and he was there. And um, my initial reaction is, oh boy, it's just he and I, um, there's no guess, let's, um, is this really valuable? And I quickly reminded myself that at the end of the day, every partnership is valuable. Um, and that I have to try to challenge myself to stop looking at, will this partnership help me? Is this partnership going to advance my goals and my mission? Is this partnership, how is this going to help me and our organization and the people we serve? But to try to just stay in the moment and accept every partnership that comes my way and be open to uh, how that might grow. So the other thing, sort of overarching principle, I. I want to remind myself about and the rest of us together is that ultimately the golden thread of uh, partnerships is, you know, our partnership, our partnership with our unhoused neighbors who we are. I don't like to say serving. Um, we are ideally walking along in this journey and I can't come in on a white horse and save anybody. I've tried that. You're welcome to keep trying that, but my experience, it doesn't work. Um, but I can walk in um, ideally in solidarity with those folks. So um, I, uh, as Rachel mentioned, I'm, I have about 25 years or so working with our unhoused community in variety of capacities for today. Um, I want to focus on part, some experiences I had in rural Colorado, um, developing the Fort Lyon community. I'll talk a little bit about that and what we're doing right now um, with Recovery Works. So uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, right now, we just opened a new nonprofit. When I was in graduate school, they, they said very clearly, do not open your own nonprofit. And I listened to that for a long time. Um, but then I realized that the caveat they put on that, don't open your own nonprofit. And the, way they, the reason they said that is because you should be collaborating within the community, that anything you want to do to try to fill gaps or provide services, ideally what you want to do is enhance the existing resources and try to uh, create a continuum with partnerships, unless there's a huge gap in the community. And that's what we experienced here in Lakewood, Colorado, which is just a western suburb of Denver. Um, there's sort of these stages of change, as I see it, in terms of um, accepting the reality of affordable housing crisis and homeless and subsequent homelessness crisis. Um, you know, there's the denial that it exists, and then there's the blaming the individual when you start seeing it, and then it's um, maybe this problem's not going away, and maybe we need to do something about it. Um, I saw that in Denver 30 years ago, sort of going through that process of acceptance that this is ultimately the acceptance that this is a structural problem and not an individual problem. And maybe as a system, as a structure, as a political structure, we need to respond to that. And here in Lakewood, Colorado, it I've I observed and I live in this county, it's called Jefferson County, that 
this county is just coming to that realization that this is in fact a problem that's not going away if we ignore it. And so we probably need to do something about it, but we sort of have no clue about what to do about it. And so they did some strategic planning over the last five years, but couldn't really get a handle on how to implement that. And so we started this nonprofit to help take some leadership um, in the community. And we um, based it on the response to their strategic plan, which called for more uh, respite beds. So we opened an 11 bed respite uh, center, 11 rooms actually. So that's folks coming primarily from hospitals and we have multiple collaborative partnerships. Uh, and that started with one of the longest existing uh, homeless service providers, and um, actually they no longer do homelessness, but the, mostly a food bank and clothing bank provider has been around for about 50 years, and they had this building that they were running as a shelter and closed it, and so they gave me access to that building for free, and that's how we were able to start so that partnership was was very critical. And then starting to uh, one of my first calls in terms of developing this respite program was to uh, contact the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, who have, a, have developed these eight principles and standards of medical respite care. And I had gotten that um, sort of tip from my work with the coalition from the for the homeless years back when we were doing respite care and so i didn't want to recreate the will that partnership was already out there um, and then started contacting uh, hospitals as uh, potential partnerships and um, the local fqhc community health centers um, you know i don't have a background in healthcare. And I didn't want to provide health care. We needed to provide health care on site, but I didn't feel like I wanted to establish that whole infrastructure within our own nonprofit. So it was partnering with the local uh, community health center to come in and bring health care on site to the medical respite program. We certainly wanted to provide um, comprehensive um, intensive case management and uh, behavioral health care. Um, we have some background in addiction treatment, so I felt like we could do some of that internally. But again, didn't want to create this infrastructure around uh, mental health care, so we partnered with the local um, uh, community mental health centers, uh, Jefferson Center for Mental Health, to provide the mental health care. Um, and then volunteers would surface and often a challenge to integrate volunteers. Oftentimes that can be a full time. So that's been a challenge on, on how to partner with volunteers and incorporate that with the organization, but certainly critical. And then reaching out to public health to do um, HIV and hep C testing and COVID vaccinations and other vaccinations. So those folks coming in to continue to provide more robust uh, services within the medical respite program. And even, you know, emergency responders and, and looking at folks um, that we may sometimes not closely collaborate with the police and and fire response <laughs> and really demonstrating to them that we are a resource um, we want to collaborate with you in terms of certainly they have the first contact with uh, many of our unhoused neighbors and it's an opportunity both to per, to bring a resource into the community for those folks but also to bring education on on the reasons for homelessness and trauma-informed interactions and being strength-based with folks and all those principles. And then a motor vehicle came in and other, other providers coming in. And so always sort of working with this uh, balance between what do we want as to be as an organization, who are we and who are we not? And sometimes um, I worked with an organization for many years very powerful in the community, but they never met a grant they didn't like. And, and they sort of continued to just grow. And anytime there was a need, 
decided, well, we're going to meet that need internally. And there's a time and place for meeting a need internally. And then there's a time and place, I think, to um, reach out and collaborate and find an, a partnership that already has existing in infrastructures. And um, I was really indoctrinated, luckily, early in my career that that's really the starting point is let's first see if this intervention, this resource exists in the community that maybe we can enhance before we create it ourselves and develop our own kingdom. Um, so then we also, we expanded recently from the medical respite program and we recently opened up, we actually were doing drop-in services at the medical respite program on the first floor and then respite was on the second floor. It, and we were kind of trying to be all things to all people as we opened up in this tiny little 3,500 square foot building. And we literally outgrew it the day we opened. Um, but two and a half years later, we moved now into for the drop in center into a 10,000 square foot uh, navigation center, continue to expand those partnerships, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, and we're in the process of developing the other half of that building into a 24 seven year round shelter bed. I had no intention at this point in my career or at any point actually to open up and run a, uh, a shelter, a 24 seven shelter. But the reality there were there, this is a county of, I think I have it somewhere of uh, the population. It's one of the largest counties in the state and there is not one shelter bed in the entire county. And so in analyzing the gaps in the system and what resources we need to bring and trying to be adaptable and being a good partner um, and um, accessing and, and our expertise and sort of just where we were at in the context of the community, where the community happens to be at in their progression in uh, accepting and responding to homelessness and affordable housing, it became really clear that we were in the best position to create this um, this twenty four seven shelter that we're in the that we're in the midst of uh, designing and um, developing. And so, part of partnership for me sometimes is. Um, not just coming with my agenda and my kingdom and my, my even necessarily my mission, which is to, um, you know, solve homelessness and the solution to homelessness is homes, but there also needs to be a rehousing infrastructure, even if we were at, um, you know, operational zero or, uh, we we ended homelessness we would still need a rehousing infrastructure so part of that is the sh is a uh, functional shelter system that i believe runs as as more of a transitional housing program anyway um what i needed to do um and we needed to do as an organization is um be a good partner in the community and adjust maybe um, some of our goals around the shelter. We recently then bought a 34 unit motel that we were going to convert to permanent supportive housing, but there were some um, zoning and other issues. And so in order to make the deal work, um, we created a bridge housing model, which the state um, was willing to fund. And so that's more of a transitional housing that hopefully in the next couple of years, we can um, convert to permanent housing. But it's been a great model to get folks immediately off the street while they're sort of putting things together uh, to move into permanent housing, usually through a voucher. Um, and ultimately wanting to, um, as I talked about, developing this rehousing in infrastructure and, I, and the amount of partnerships that that's going to take. So next slide. This is probably obvious to most of you. It, it, it sort of is becoming more and more obvious over the years to me that 
you know, partnerships, ultimately it's about relationships. We are collaborating with, with people. Um, and of course, organizations are made up with pe made up of people, but certainly my experience is when I really reach out and usually I try to find connectors. There's people that are just really good connectors. Um, that say, hey, you need to meet so and so, and and so, my my process has evolved where I try to start when I'm trying to develop partnerships. Who are the connectors in the community? Who knows who I need to get to know? And then it's really about um, you know starting those relationships, and a relationship is a dialogue and a dance, and and again I. I feel like it's more helpful for me to go in and I have my, we have our mission and our vision and, and certainly we want to stay true to that. And where does our mission and vision align with your mission and vision? And how can we continue to adapt to meet the greater mission of addressing affordable housing and homelessness? Um, and, you know, why do we exist in the community? Um, Again, who are we and who are we not? Um, that balance between um, being true to our mission, not drifting too far, and being flexible to meet the needs if we have the capacity and the expertise. Um, I think we have some sometimes a responsibility to maybe adjust our mission a little bit to meet the needs of the greater community. And, and I think you know, this, this principle of, of servant leadership, um, and, and, and what is my stance, um, in terms of developing partnership? Is it just about, you know, what, how can you help me or, or should I, you know, can I truly take this stand and this attitude of how can we be of service? um within our mission how can we be of service to the community how can we be of service to your organization um we have we're running into some struggles with our new navigation center um with businesses um a number of businesses aren't real excited that we're there and we have a bunch of shopping carts out front and folks hanging out in the neighborhood and um and so you know, I reach out to all the business uh, lead, you know, the business owners adjacent to us and, you know, kind of get a sense of what's what you what are you struggling with? Well, there's trash all over. And so we we created kind of a little work program within the NAV Center where we pay people for two hours, 25 bucks an hour to clean up the neighborhood um, every day. And e even though um you know, it's certainly not all our um, trash, um, but that's how we can be a better partner and how we can be of service to the neighborhood and try to be um, try to be a resource and 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 continually grow to be seen as a resource and an asset versus a liability. Uh, next. Just continuing on this be of service, um, you know, and I've certainly experienced it over my career where at being in organizations where we, I think the attitude is we're sort of building our kingdom and, and I'm sure we've all, you know, we are, we're always dealing with these, you know, we're rationing um, inadequate resources, which is inherently unfair. And there's a natural tendency to compete for inadequate resources within the nonprofit sector um, and sort of build our own kingdoms. And, you know, just some basic principles, this, you know, the, the we're, we're just bigger together and, and, and it doesn't have to be a competition. And, and that in the back of my mind, am I really trying to be of service to the greater community or am I trying to be of service to my own even ego or ambition or growing my organization? And so, I, you know, constantly challenging myself and other organizations, 
about how are we partnering um, to strategically address these uh, affordable housing and homelessness issues within our community, um, rather than just building our own nonprofit for its own sake. Um, sort of talked about the, I don't wanna beat a dead horse on the servant leadership, but, um, but just, you know, am I always taking an attitude of, of building something greater than myself? Or am I just trying to build out my own organization? You know, people, my, my experience has been that people, um, people want to participate in something impactful. Um, people want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And that's my experience with the private sector and certainly the public sector and obviously the nonprofit sector, but businesses. And that a clear vision is really inspiring. Um, and when I can to come in and, and it's sort of taking from this attitude of, I'm not just building this or people aren't in, inspired by me creating a nonprofit organization. People are in or growing one. People are inspired by all of us trying to address an extremely complex social problem. And so if I can continue to articulate the vision in um, community meetings, I really try to respond to every invitation as much as possible from um, registered um, community organizations, from local government, city council, from business organizations. You know, it's a, as an off the chart introvert, it's really challenging for me to go out there and engage with folks, but that that's what works. If I can just keep being out there and articulating the vision without asking for anything, partnerships seem to really surface. And, and I really try to challenge myself, again, sort of back to, to today, to the one guy coming in. Well, you know, one person that's part of the 12-step community doesn't feel like a valuable partnership. Um, compared to meeting with a city council person or the mayor, uh, the local government, but but to and, and certainly there's a time and place for everything, but everybody in the community obviously has some value um, for the greater good, and so I, it's not up to me to determine necessarily when somebody surfaces and wants to be a partner, whether they would be a good partner or not. It's up to me to develop a relationship with that person and be open to where that might lead. And then um, we want and need to carry out, I put our mission in quotes because um, our it's not just about our mission as recovery works. Um, it's about our mission as the greater community. Uh, next. So a couple of examples of partnerships that, that I've been involved with um, over the years. And I, I picked a couple, one is rural and one is suburban. Um, so the rural one is called Fort Lyon and um, we started this when I was with the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, um, and uh, it was to repurpose a what was a post-Civil War fort um, down in Southeast Colorado with in called uh, Los Animas with a population of 2,700, and it was in Bent County. And, um, you know, it, it's pretty isolated. It's 200 miles from Denver. So it's about a three and a half, it's about a six, six and a half, seven hour round trip drive. Um, and what was needed, what's been needed in the community, and they were really trying to figure out how are we going to repurpose this? What are we going to do with it? It's this beautiful campus. It's 552 acres. It has all these old turn of the century post-Civil War buildings. It was a, a sanitarium for many years for TB. Then it was a neuropsych hospital um, for about 70 years. Um, and then the last 10 years before we repurposed it, they put razor wire around it and, and ran it as a, um, you know, a low level prison 
um, basically for ambulatory uh, compromised seniors. Um, so it was never it was never meant to be a prison, but it was run that way for about ten years. And um, there was a big need in the community for um, addiction treatment. Um, basically, you know what what is typically called residential treatment or inpatient treatment and so this was an opportunity to repurpose it for that reason um, and so we started going down there a couple of us just looking at it meeting with the local community um, bill long this was in rural colorado the county commissioners really run the show and it was a three person county commission and and it was first understanding that who who runs the show who really um is are the central connectors who are the decision makers and so starting that relationship and then also there's two local community colleges so that felt like a natural place for us to start so we met with the two local community college presidents not necessarily with it with an agenda but just to start the relationships and to just get a feel of you know what's the culture down there and which way was the wind blowing and this i put bill long on there specifically because he was a county commissioner he was really um uh advocating for repurposing because it was critical to their economy when the prison left and they were we were really closing um there's a whole private prison industry in this county. And so there was a real culture of incarceration and a lot of employment was dependent on incarceration and, and uh, the criminal justice system. And so we were going, we were walking into that culture of sort of crime and punishment and Bill Long, um, came from that you know was part of that and indoctrinated in that but he also was really skeptical skeptical because they had 11 wardens in 10 years and so his big question to us are we going to just come and go or are we committed to it and you know we were just filling it out and couldn't make any promises and we we went down there as much as possible i think i was driving down there every couple weeks just to try to meet people and get a feel for it and there was one time um, my colleague and i drove down there and we had been meeting with bill and he seemed pretty skeptical didn't think we were you know we were sort of city slickers maybe not um trustworthy and the other question is like well, there's not going to be you know there's not going to be razor wire around this campus anymore how are you going to keep the community safe and and those two issues of um are you going to be here for the long run and are you going to keep the community safe he never said those directly but he kept alluding to those in different ways and and I'll never forget we were we had been down we drove down there three and a half hours we spent the day there it's getting late we're real anxious to get back home we're getting in the car and Bill said do you want to grab a burrito at Carmen's which was the local restaurant and you know we were 50 50 we were dying to get out of there and both of us kind of instinctively thought, you know, this might be important. We're going to bite the bullet and stay in this relationship with this Bill Long. We went out to dinner. It got real clear that his issues were around um, reliability and safety, and we addressed them at that dinner. And it it was the it was a pivotal turning point in this relationship with him and his advocacy for us and it it catapulted this project into the next level simply because we were willing to kind of stay a little bit longer literally to have dinner with this guy um who you know it, who was important and so it sort of went back to this to the start of ultimately this is just about relationships and i have to make some adjustments to um to continue to develop relationships and you never know where a partnership's going to go um and you know and then there was really different partnerships and and um rural colorado 
um, the players were a lot different than in central Denver. There was the, the pig farm, which had a hard time um, hot, keeping employees. And so our guests, we created another employment program where we, where they were training folks to do, you know, artificial insemination of, of the pigs at the pig farm. And it gave the, the local pig farm consistent workers. And our, it gave our guests who were in two years of early recovery, um, sort of some experience in employment and same with this locker company. So it's really, you know, everything is local and partnerships. You know, I certainly had no intention of partnering with a pig farmer. Um, but that was that's who we needed to partner with at that time um, to sort of make the collaborative partnerships uh, work. Next. Um, and then the the recovery works, which I talked talked a little bit about. This is suburban. So this is just west of Denver. Um, and this population is one hundred and fifty eight thousand. Um, I talked a little bit about there's a real leadership gap in the community around homelessness and housing. And so, um, you know, I sort of wanted to just quietly come in and do this, this little medical respite program. But it just, as we sort of became ingrained in the community, it became clear that we needed to be a better partner in terms of providing education and leadership and going to community meetings and and then the ARPA money, you know, was really coming down through the state over these last couple of years. And, you know, we didn't necessarily intend to buy a motel or to buy a building to run a shelter, but we also felt like as these partnerships were developing and the local government and the local community and other providers were really sort of crying out for um, a more robust rehousing infrastructure, we felt like we had an obligation to be a good partner and to take on some of these uh, leadership roles and develop these, um, again, like I said, with the shelter and the motel to create a rehousing infrastructure that, um, you know, it was serendipitous in terms of our, our having been in the community for a couple of years and established a good reputation as a service provider, the money coming together. And so these partnerships started, um, maybe weren't serving us per se, but it was time for us to serve sort of the greater community. And then it, it continues to really evolve as we speak in a kind of a, re, uh, you know, back and forth in terms of supporting one another and our partnership. Um, and just that which way is the wind blowing? Um, you know, it's a fairly conservative um, suburb, and there's a there's been a lot of hyperbole around um, migrate. You know, migrants and um, Denver's been a real central repository of migrants, and there's been a huge migrant response in Denver, and there's all this fear about it. You know, overflowing into this community, and um, you know, supposedly the complaint is you're going to take services away from our own, home, you know, unhoused folks. And so one of the ways um, we sort of in a, in a recent city council meeting to try to um, sort of tamp that down is um, just talk about, you know, how are, that we're going to be prioritizing veterans and elderly, which we are. Um, but I, I think to, to understand who our audience is and, and that, um, it, it's, it's easier to sort of have a discussion around, um, these really high intense issues around immigration and homelessness and affordable housing, um, by starting with, um, 
starting with folks that we're going to serve that maybe aren't as much of a lightning rod. Um, people tend to be more supportive of veterans and folks that are elderly unhoused rather than unaccompanied adults who are chronic substance users. And so to begin to articulate that this is a structural problem, um, you know, dealing with the reality of oftentimes building partnerships obviously starts with knowing your audience and speaking first in languages that they can understand. Uh, one more, I think. These were just some of the partnerships I talked about. They're real specific to, as you all know, everything's local. Um, people want to help, but they don't want to, they don't know how. And so it's incumbent for, for us to articulate our needs, to ask for help, to tell people what we need is a great way to build partnerships. Um, um, and then part one of the things I try to do is as we're starting an organization, certainly, or starting a new program, we really try to be kind of take all referrals at the beginning, sort of want to be seen as a good partner, you know, without getting into mission creep, but at least initially, because oftentimes if people say, oh, we made a referral there and they didn't take it, and so they stopped sort of partnering with you. So I always try to be a little more liberal on taking referrals and being open and low barrier initially in order to develop those partner relationships at the beginning. That's really important. I found that to be really important. Also creating community space. So at our navigation center, we we're building out extra offices for other providers to come in, for other partners to come in. And so just the physical space has been really helpful in order to uh, engage other partners that everybody's welcome to sort of come in and we can talk about how you might use our space and vice versa. Um, and again, it's really, I, I think for me, the bottom line is, you know, can I be flexible in my own um, ambitions and goals and really adapt to the current circumstances, the current needs, the current community, and sort of live in that reality in order to develop relationships and partnerships. And I think I'll leave it with that. Yeah, James, thank you so much. Um, it's just incredible. Um, the different ways in which you've worked in different communities to facilitate partnerships, um, to be of service to people who are experiencing homelessness um, in partnership. And, um, you know, I just, I so appreciate you coming and, and sharing with us today. And uh, for our audience, I, I used to get to work with James many years ago at the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless and um, just am continuously inspired by the work that he is doing. So with that, I think we're gonna turn it over now to our next uh, presenters and um, I'm excited to introduce them as well. So we have Daryl Mitchell, who's the Vice President, uh, Recovery Communities Aspire Indiana, and Mike Keevan, who's the Vice President of Social Drivers of Health at Aspire Indiana. And we'll start a little bit with Daryl's background. So after over the last several years, Daryl has led an impacted change in the recovery supports field at the state and national levels. He is the founder of the Indiana Affiliation of Recovery Residences and serves as the president of the National Alliance of Recovery Residences, also referred to as NAR. In 2017, Daryl was instrumental in the drafting and passing of legislation that placed recovery housing standards into Indiana law. Daryl studied public relations and marketing at Purdue University, has a bachelor's of science in addictions counseling and a master's of business administration degree from Indiana Wesleyan University. Daryl did not plan a career in healthcare, behavioral health, or addiction treatment. Fortunately, with the help of others, Daryl overcame addiction and has been a person in long-term recovery for many years. Experiencing the miracle of recovery in his own life inspired 
pursuing a new professional path of service to those with mental illness and substance use disorders. In 2019, the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, also referred to as ONDCP, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture asked Daryl to author a paper for the Rural Community Action Guide. In January 2020, Daryl was invited to the White House to attend the ONDCP's launch of the Rural Community Action Guide and to meet with senior leaders. Additionally, I want to uh, read you the bio of um, Mike Heaven. So he's the Vice President of Social Drivers and oversees a robust array of programs that address non-medical factors affecting a person's overall health and well-being. This includes housing, employment, legal services, as well as other social factors that impact health, such as finances, education, and access to food. In this role, he focuses on the integration of the social determinants of health services line within the existing healthcare services at Aspire. Um, thank you both so much for joining. I think, Daryl, you're going to kick us off here, right? Correct. Thank you. We can go to the next slide. Great. So good afternoon, everybody. It's good to be with you. Um, what I wanted to do is uh, tell you a little bit about the organization <clears throat> that I also serve as the executive director of. Uh, and our pathway uh, to a partnership and to become a subsidiary of Aspire Indiana Health uh, and how that has changed the model of, uh, of the services that we deliver uh, and has impacted our, uh, our success rates. So uh, Progress House is the name of the organization that was founded in 1961. So 62 years, it'll be 63 in December. Uh, and so it's the, the oldest recovery residence in Indiana and one of the oldest in, in the country. <clears throat> For decades, uh, it's been considered Indiana's premier recovery house. And for a very long time, that was just a safe, structured, sober environment for people to live. Um, and in many cases, probably 95 to 100 percent of the cases, uh, we have people that are were at one time unsheltered. So um people that are now willing to get into the recovery <clears throat> uh phase of their of their life and oftentimes look for a recovery house to do that so we serve that that clientele what happened with the opioid epidemic is it shifted the average resident profile so at one time we were serving and this is a men's program uh one time serving uh the middle-aged alcoholic is the primary uh resident and as a result of the opioid epidemic, <clears throat> what I saw is that there was a younger uh, generation of individuals that were in trouble sooner uh, than you know somebody uh, middle aged, uh, and in many cases because of the uh, the seriousness of the narcotics that um, have been available, uh, now it was uh, you see overdose rates that had spiked. So <clears throat> I begin to see, uh, you know, not only we hear about recidivism, people back uh, in and out of the, the, um, the correctional system, uh, that's true. Uh, but I was, I was also seeing people that were coming back multiple times um, at Progress House or other facilities, actually, uh, and other, uh, from other programs that were what we would consider to be chronic relapsers. So these are folks that um, I was fortunate enough, the rooms of recovery and some outside services were uh, sufficient for me, uh, but those services weren't adequate enough for this group. So it's a bandwidth of people that, uh, you know, were just chronically being moved around to different places. So begin to think about how to reimagine treatment, uh, recovery housing and recovery supports and how they're designed uh, and delivered. And so I began looking for a partner and in April of 2019, I met with the folks from Aspire Indiana and saw that they were serving the same um, population, but in a different uh, manner. They were doing outpatient work and uh, some home and community-based work, <clears throat> and they weren't seeing the success rates that they were interested in seeing. Um, and so we began looking at uh, a potential partnership uh, that ultimately led to 
uh, a merger or a consolidation in nonprofits. You don't buy nonprofits. Uh, they're generally um, you know, governed by a board of directors. So uh, in this case, we became a wholly governed subsidiary of Aspire Indiana. So the next slide tells you a little bit about, um, so we'll go to the next slide, who Aspire is. And then this will uh, help us describe this reimagining uh, model that I'm, I'm uh, talking about. So Aspire is uh, actually made up of a few different organizations that have been consolidated. Uh, one was a federally qualified health center, so Aspire Indiana Health, um, and then Aspire Indiana, which is the uh, community mental health center. And then Mike's going to talk to you about some of our housing corporation and the social uh, drivers of health. So uh, we serve about 25,000, 30,000 unduplicated clients a year through the healthcare system um, and provide physical, behavioral health. Uh, social services, and substance use disorder treatment. So <clears throat> between all the organizations, we have over 115 years of experience serving those, um, and really the, you know, the, the safety net population in some regards, uh, some of the most complex uh, cases uh, that, that people experience. So um, that was the strength of, of the consolidation, one of the strengths. And as I mentioned, we're nonprofit and independent uh, organization. So the next slide uh, really took a look or takes a look at these different elements uh, that we that we know and John was speaking about the, the different partnerships that, you know, traditionally we look for people that are able to provide the services uh, that are listed um, in each of the corners. And one of the things that attracted me to Aspire uh, as a potential partner was they had already gone down the road of integrating a federally health, um, uh, an FQHC, a fairly qualified health center with the community mental health center. And the reason why they had done that initially is that they saw that the people that they were treating in the community mental health center was dying 20 to 25 years before their counterparts. And they were dying for generally health related reasons. So they were having a difficult time finding uh, a medical partner that would on a consistent basis serve, um, you know, notably the SMI population, the seriously mental ill population. So they decided they were going to get into the primary health care business and had begun to do that work. So there was a um, an indication that there was uh, this cultural capability to bringing together businesses that generally do not, um, you know, uh, work under the same roof. So the primary health care, <clears throat> excuse me, we do provide some behavioral health through that, uh, the FQ, but it's primarily medical providers uh, and an infectious disease um, group. And then on the behavioral health side is where our outpatient addiction services, uh, our home and community-based services, uh, we serve like a four-county area in central Indiana. Um, we have supported group living, so group homes, and then medical and legal aid. The recovery communities, I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail. Uh, we have a treatment facility, recovery housing, and then transitional housing. And then Mike will get into the social determinants of, of health in and, and each of those sections. But one of the things that, that I had discovered and have seen over the years is that in order for somebody to get whole health, um, you know, oftentimes consumers are savvy navigators of the healthcare system. So uh, you know, they'll be sent somewhere to, to be dealt with them from the neck down and, um, you know, in a healthcare set setting, then they may end up with some behavioral health services, um, you know, from the neck up. And then there's these community based, uh, the spiritual and the social uh, resources that people need <clears throat> for their emotional health and spiritual health. And those are often, uh, you know, in, in other groups. So the ability for somebody to, to assist uh, a client or patient, uh, look at all of these pieces that they need in their, in their lives to live their best lives um, are often a challenge. The next slide. So we, one of the things we've been able to do as a result of consolidating these organizations is I've been able to bring under one roof uh, at both our treatment facility, which is an ASAM 3.5 and 3.1 facility, 
as well as our recovery house and the main facility has uh, you know, serves 96 uh, clients are all the puzzle pieces that you see in, in this puzzle house. So we have on-site health clinic uh, staffed by nurses and physicians. We also have psychiatrists and addictionologists. So those are located in the building. Um, in the treatment facility, we're able to induct MAT uh, for anybody suffering uh, from opioid use disorder. So those medications that have been um, you know, federally uh, recognized as appropriate treatment for opioid disorder. Uh, and then when somebody moves on, you know, from this induction, moves on into the recovery house, then they are continue, are able to continue on that, that MAT um, medication. Uh, you know, also, um, in addition to uh, the individual, or, well, behavioral health care, there is, in addition to those health care pieces, individual and group therapy uh, for the clients. You know, John mentioned, um, you know, mutual aid or 12-step support. Um, both of these facilities uh, have a foundation of 12-step recovery. Uh, and one of the other um, pieces worth mentioning is when we, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about um, each of those facilities, uh, you know, from aerial views and things, but at Progress House specifically, uh, we have an operations team that is made up only of people that have gone through the program and have lived experience. So oftentimes when somebody comes into a uh, you know, facility, whatever kind of facility it is, looking for resources, uh, there's this notion that you know, I, you know, I, I may think that I'm either terminally unique or that you don't understand or you can't understand. So having you know, a peer um, group and recovery coaches all with lived experience you know, as part of the orientation or the interview process, the orientation and missions process has really, um, you know, almost been a secret sauce for us, uh, you know, to assist people in that transition. And then also uh, it has impacted uh, the success rates. So we have housing assistance, um, you know, in addition to the safe and structured environment, Mike's team can assist when somebody's through the other programs with, with additional housing, and we have case management and skills training. Uh, so I mentioned this younger generation of people that we've seen um, now, you know, in need of services much earlier than what traditional, um, you know, brackets of uh, of people or age brackets uh, uh, have been. And one of the things that I've seen is uh, this group. They hit a, a bottom earlier, so you know they don't have uh, experience professionally often. Uh, they may not have the ability to manage a budget. Uh, in some cases, they don't know how to get their driver's license or social security card. Uh, so there's a need for group skills or life skills, often taught in groups. But these life skills, instead of just saying, we got a safe, sober environment for somebody, uh, come here and go to, to 12 step meetings, um, the ability to provide this integrated care model where you, know, you have the, the ability to to deal with the social issues you're dealing with, getting some um, you know, help with financial fitness and relapse prevention, anger management, interpersonal communication skills. At the same time, you, you, know, you, you can go see your primary uh, medical provider uh, you know, in, the, in the same building and then go to your group or your individual therapy um, in an environment where you have other people that have been uh, down the path that you're on uh, for a longer period of time. And, and I think that's the other um, ingredient to the secret sauce, if you will, is that those individuals can mirror back to, uh, you know, other clients, um, what living, uh, you know, in a recovery lifestyle looks like. So when somebody thinks they just can't make it through whatever life is, is uh, presenting to them, uh, there's examples with this integrated model. So as far as just the, uh, the continuum, that's the makeup of the, the different beds. So we're, we're bumping up against 250 beds, and we're looking at expansion right now. So for certainly the Medicaid population, many that are coming from the unsheltered community, um, it's the only continuum like it uh, uh, in the state of Indiana. The next slide. So one of the things that I wanted to... Um, to show is just a graphic representation of what somebody's journey would look like. So let's say that somebody is in acute care is, is one of the places where people will come from 
um, you know, when they're looking to get into the residential continuum, it could be a psych, uh, psychiatric ward, there could be an overdose, um, but they're only going to be in that in, uh, that acute setting long enough to uh, ensure their safety, and then they have to look for the next opportunity. So for many, many years, the unsheltered population, the Medicaid population um, in uh, Indiana did not have a detox facility available to them. If you didn't have commercial insurance and resources, uh, then you were often in a bind. So in order to get into a recovery house, uh, in that situation where there's you know an abstinence requirement so that it's not a, a trigger for other people living in that, um, that community, uh, the best you could do is say, hey, you know, try to stay sober, uh, get to a meeting, and, um, you know, let's see you again in five days. Let's see how you're doing at that point, another drug screen. So uh, we decided that wasn't good enough, um, and we opened Mockingbird Hill, which is the facility uh, pictured in the upper right. So it is a beautiful facility on 17 acres. Uh, and this is the American Society of uh, Addiction Medicine. Uh, thanks, Rachel, for that, that comment. So that's the 3-1 and 3-5, which is just the levels of care. So you can think about that as a 28-day treatment facility type of model. So once somebody is done there, this yellow arrow kind of represents somebody's um, travel through the continuum. Then they can move to, to Progress House or another recovery house. The Progress House model is a six-month model where they're they're still getting treatment um, services, but they're now doing more recovery work. Uh, there's more independence, uh, but there still is the structure and almost like a college curriculum. There's certain, certain requirements of the program that they have to meet. When completed with that successfully, you know, we have transitional housing then that people can step into and be in that environment for two plus years. You know, oftentimes when somebody finds themselves in this continuum, they've either uh, they have a, they may have a criminal past, so they can't find a friendly landlord to rent to them. Uh, they ought, they could have some financial problems, you know, the, you know, the, obviously the legal problems. Uh, so offering this next step transitional housing, um, it still brings uh, a, an opportunity for people to be in a recovery community, uh, to still have some structure, uh, but they don't have to have the credit. Uh, rating and or we're aware of, the, of what their legal past is because they've come through the other programs. When somebody's ready to step back into their communities, those purple arrows are just pointed to our outpatient clinics in different uh, cities in, in Indiana uh, where people can go and see their primary care provider and uh, their behavioral health provider. So the model that we're describing, the Progress House model specifically, uh, was awarded by SAMHSA uh, one of the 10 winners of the Recovery Innovation Challenge last year. So I believe um, there were 3,000 national applicants and uh, there were 10 uh, winners um, that were uh, recognized and, and you know, given small grants. And we were the only Indiana organization uh, to, to be um, classified as a winner and the only recovery house in the country uh, that was awarded that. Thank you. So uh, the next slide. Quickly, the success rates, um, you know, as a result of this integrated model, so having something available to the client there where he, you know, he's he can go across uh, the building to see his primary care provider, go upstairs to see his recovery coach and attend a group, go downstairs for a 12-step meeting, you know, all in a place where he lives and eats. Um, that has led to this increase uh, that you see in our traditional success rates. So where we were running 28 to 35%, uh, we're now seeing 60% and even uh, greater. And that number, uh, the way we determine that number is somebody beginning the program, completing it successfully, uh, is the, you know one of the data points. But the biggest thing, uh, which is some of these other um, subjective uh, things, the, you know, it's the change behavior. It's the change in mannerisms and language. Uh, it's the connection that people have, the being reunited with their family, um, giving back, beginning to support people earlier in the program. You know, we have, uh, you know, Big Brother programs. So they come back as sponsors. Um, so uh, they're just, a, it's almost being able to witness the lights come on is something we'll say in, in, in the world of recovery, but seeing people 
uh, you know, be in a place where they've been reunited and are in a career path or education path. It's like seeing miracles. So it's a real honor to be in that environment. So what I want to do at this point um, is turn it over to my colleague, Mike Keevan, and have him tell you a little bit about social drivers. All right. Thanks, Daryl. I appreciate this opportunity to, to talk a little bit more about the social drivers and just wanted to, to give a little bit more detail about what some of those could look like, what it means to aspire, as there's lots of definitions out there as for social determinants or so, social drivers of health. But much like Daryl mentioned, as, as he's seeing people younger, maybe that lack some of those life skills uh, going through the recovery continuum, we see that represented too in the, in the social drivers. So when we think about employment at Aspire, we some of those skills, basic skills of just creating a resume uh, or, or interview skills or just what do I wear to an interview? Uh, are, are things that we're addressing. So coming alongside somebody is, like, is what I like to, to say that we're doing. We're not doing all the work for them. We're coming alongside to support them and meet them where they're at. And that can also include overcoming maybe a, a criminal record. So how do we, how do we work with, with those individuals? And we have partnerships with the, the state vocational rehabilitation. We've got some programs through social security. Uh, as well as the Department of Mental Health and Addictions, where we can address some of those, those employment issues. We think about housing. Uh, as as Daryl mentioned, uh, Aspire has several different corporations where we uh, address, we're a pro actually a property manager, and we address housing. So whether it's like an, a, an uh, apartment complex like Next Steps, specifically set aside for recovery housing, we also have some other HUD property, HUD funded properties that are set aside for serious mental illness, elderly, uh, maybe a physical impairment. Uh, as we as we address that, and we and we uh, handle the things like collecting rent, maintenance issues, everything that a, that a property manager would deal with. We also have another side of housing where we provide direct service. So as I mentioned with employment, that coming alongside piece of people, we can help people locate housing. But we've got connections with landlords that, as Daryl mentioned, that can be a struggle. Maybe they stay at next steps for a couple of years. Where do they go after that? Well, having that criminal record or maybe an eviction or financial issues in their past can be a huge barrier. So as we work with landlords, create those partnerships we can address some of those uh, housing issues. We also chair the region for the continuum of care. So we have um, permanent supportive housing grants, emergency solution grants, as well as working with several other uh, agencies like uh, the Coalition for Homelessness Intervention and Prevention and the Indiana Housing Community Development Authority. So working closely with the agencies in our community to address that housing issues. We have a medical legal partnership. So one of the, the big things that we see coming through the recovery community that Daryl mentioned is getting a driver's license or, or some of those social security cards. So that is the number one issue that we address is our, our partnership with an attorney can help get people a, a driver's license. Maybe they've lost it or never had one. Child uh, visitation, child support is another area that they address, as well as uh, maybe a prior eviction on their record. And that is very hard to find housing if you've had an eviction on your record. So can we get that removed as well as expungement? Another thing that I'm excited about is education certification. So we talk a lot in employment about an ABC job, uh, getting a job, and then a better job, and then a career job, and ga gaining certification can help along that journey and that path. So we've got some grant funding to, to help people maybe find a, a certification to drive a forklift or uh, safe food handling, different certifications like that, or a medical assistant certification. Something else that we recently did was a hospitality training, which was a paid training uh, that we provided with a partnership of uh, local uh, invest in Hamilton County 
partnership where they funded that, paid the participants to come and gain certification. In a week, they had a hospitality certification, and then our employment team was able to come alongside and help those folks get placed. Two of those folks came from Progress House, where they had uh, a, a criminal background uh, for one of the individuals, and it took a little while, but we were able to help that, that person gain that certification and gain employment. And then uh, benefits counseling. So if I have Social Security or uh, Medicaid or maybe food stamps, what does that look like if I go to work? How is that going to impact my benefits? And then accessing resources, uh, things like food, bus passes, clothing, you know, help people get those resources that, you, that they need to get to their appointments or get to their job. And next slide, please. So as we think about how that looked at Aspire with that partnership that Daryl described, uh, we've made a lot of changes in the last few years and, and we needed to, to break down those silos and get those departments talking and communicating with each other because we spoke different languages. We used acronyms, uh, sometimes the same acronym, but they meant different things in the different worlds, whether it was the primary care world or behavioral health or recovery or the social drivers. But we made some changes in our structure uh, of having Daryl and I, the, the recovery representation and the social drivers representation in various meetings. So from the executive level, the uh, senior leadership level, operational meetings, service integration meetings, and then something as specific as uh, maybe a client staffing where there might be a specific client where primary care would meet and, and the, the behavioral health team would meet. And now we can be a part of those. Maybe we're noticing that, that somebody that was referred to us for housing, we're having some issues connecting with them or some other issues going on. We can bring that client up and be a part of those meetings and have all those providers together in the same space talking about that client and the best way to serve them. And that helped keep people informed. Uh, the next slide, please. And then what kind of response uh, that would we need from SDOH? Because as we, we integrated more and we had this shared space and shared communication, we needed to be able to respond more to the other teams, whether it be Daryl's team in recovery or primary care or the behavioral health care. And one of the things that we heard was we need to make a process easier so that we can generate referrals because we use systems that are different from everybody else. We might log information in the homeless management information system, for instance, but that doesn't communicate to the rest of the agency and they don't have access to that. So we started a process where people could refer directly through the electronic health record to the, the social drivers of health. And that created some issues for us because we had never worked in the electronic health record. So it's not qu been quite two years ago that we started that process. And the, the other piece was, okay, we made the referral. Well, what's happened with that referral? So our social drivers team is acknowledging the referral and then logging their notes of what's happening in the electronic health record so that we can share that communication. And maybe somebody from Daryl's team can, can make a referral on a client that needs uh, uh, employment or needs housing. And then they can also follow up the electronic health record to see what's going on. Because we don't always share that same space to tell, to tell them or keep them informed about every detail that, that's happening with that engagement. And then uh, the last point there is we need to continue to move past integration and be unified. So we, we continue to work on those those meetings and the sharing of that information. And I see, uh, Rachel, that you're saying that we need to move on to the questions. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, James, Daryl, and Mike for presenting. I hope that folks um, found that informative and kind of gave an idea of what's possible through partnership um, where you can come together with people to support the whole person. So I want to do one question from um, 
the audience first, just because this is your learning community and I wanna make sure you get everything you want out of it. Um, so Faith asks, and this is for James, you mentioned you borrow from a 12 step program. Does that include the religious angle? Is it non-denominational denominational or strictly secular? Um, so James, I don't know if you want to respond to that, to Faith's question. Yeah, um, thanks for that question. It's I have found over the years, it's it's kind of a, first of all, most folks that I have worked with over the years want to talk about spirituality. And it's a tricky thing, of course, in this, in our secular dominated work. Um, you know, we can't really present that necessarily. I think the 12 step um, bringing 12 step into um, our work has been really helpful for its own sake because it's, you know, um, the most successful recovery model um, that there is. And, and it's a naturally occurring uh, in the community so folks can access it whether they're working with us or not. And so it's great to introduce people to that incredible resource. And I, I don't know, my experience is you just bring it in and people can talk about their higher power or, um, and I, I've never been sort of confronted or run into any conflict around bringing a spiritual, what's a so-called spiritual program in, into a secular environment. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but um, it hasn't been a problem in 25 years for me. Thanks, James. Um, Faith, if that doesn't answer your question, feel free to add a follow-up, but um, definitely hearing that it's part of whole person care. Some people may be drawn to faith-based activities and we wanna support whatever is meaningful to people that we're working with. Um, this next question, James, is also for you. Since we have a mix of communities in the audience, how would you advise a smaller rural COC grantee to begin developing partnerships? that would offer whole person care? What are some first steps? Yeah, I I, I think I kind of talked about, um, you know, it's obviously you can only, you can only work with what you have to work with. A lot of um, rural communities do have a community college network. That was a really great place for, for us to start. Um, they have a lot of connections and, and they even created programs like they created a nursing program because there was a real need for that as we started collaborating with them. Um, and then again, it's sort of these um, connectors. Um, some like oftentimes there's a community health center and we were able to, they didn't really have a robust behavioral health within the community health center, but they had the capacity and the infrastructure where they could develop um, a behavioral health response um, by hiring a therapist, for example. Um, and, and it sort of enabled them to build out their, their capacity as well. So for me, um, you know, it was, and then sometimes we had to import some things um, from, from the city. So um, again, I don't know that it's a lot different other than finding connectors and thinking out thinking outside of your typical partners like like the community college um, or, or elsewhere. Great, thank you so much. Um, this next question is for you, Daryl. Um, can you share more about the timeline mm -hmm. for transitioning from a recovery housing operator to becoming fully integrated into Aspire and what that process was like? Sure. Um, it, there was a lot of heavy lifting, uh, you know, we having two organizations, uh, both nonprofits, just during the, you know, due diligence stage of uh, the considering, you know, consideration of the co consolidation was 10 months. And a lot of groups uh, were broken down to look at specific parts of the business uh, and how it would, um, you know, how it would play out in a pragmatic way, you know, practically what it would look like. Uh, an example is, you know, I mentioned employing people with lived experience at, at Progress House. Well, we're doing that now across the agency. So we had to take a look at some HR policies, um, you know, around people with legal past. Uh, you know, we have 700 employees. Um, so there were there were things that were 
um, you know, that have been very meaningful in that regard. Uh, Spire is a joint commission organization, so there was a lot of work uh, in order to get a, a recovery house to a point where they could, um, you know, be accredited as a joint commission, um, as part of the joint commission, you know, uh, organization. Um, so, you know, the other thing that I'd like to mention about the timeline, and it's ongoing, Mike talked about staffing, you know, I, the work we can we can describe a whole bunch of um, business uh, processes and things like that that we've uh, changed and improved, but the cultural component, the philosophical component of getting an addictionologist, a behavioral health therapist, a recovery coach, uh, somebody from you know Mike's group, social drivers, uh, and the you know the primary care people, the nurses, the EMA, all at the table on a regular basis to talk about the whole health of a client in a respectful way, um, you know, to with one another about their area of expertise or the area that they're working with that client on. That's been um, a lot of the work, you know, and, and so we've done things like I've taken our executive team through the 12 steps, even though some of them aren't in, um, you know, recovery, just to understand some language. We've looked at where the integration of the 12 steps and psychotherapy happens and what that might look like. Uh, you know, what does, uh, you know, recovery language, how, how would that impact some of the home and community-based stuff? And then at the same time, being organic, which is what a lot of recovery organizations are, understanding now that there are things around PHI, CFR 42, uh, with private health information, and being a part of a larger organization where, um, you know, the healthcare component is, is real, right? So the cultural piece is an ongoing piece of work. And, but it has to begin with leadership saying we're committed to this. We want all of these voices at the table because it benefits the client. And, and that's the thing that I think that uh, is, has really made a difference. Thank you. Thank you for lifting that up. As someone who was doing some of this work not too long ago, I know how challenging um, those cultural shifts can be. So just would encourage everyone listening to do that hard work because it's it has the most payoff in the end. Um, this next question is for either of you. So whoever would like to answer first, feel free. Um, so both of your programs contain a continuum of low barrier housing first and recovery housing options. How do you operationalize supporting program participants in self-determination and selection of the housing that best meets their needs? Uh... I'd be happy to take a, a stab at that. You know, recovery, um, you know, and housing choices, these are all self-driven decisions. Uh, there's a level of willingness that has to be there, you know, in order for somebody to benefit from services. So part of the process is, is the initial interview, you know, taking a look at where somebody's um, you know, in, in the Office of Recovery, SAMHSA's Office of Recovery has been interesting. You know, they look at health, they look at housing, they look at community, they look at purpose. So talking about somebody's recovery capital, if you will, as an example, where you sit, and also some of the obligations of residency in some of the programs or participation in the programs, what that will look like. The other thing that I would say about housing first and, and recovery housing is I was at a SAMHSA um, you know, meeting, I think it was last year, and it was the, the, the recovery housing group and housing first. Well, in some ways people would say, well, that's abstinence versus harm reduction. What I would say is that having these kind of conversations with this these groups, this group, is, is allowing us to move from either or to and. And the and is so important when you're asking this question so that it isn't a bias towards this is what I th think you should do because it's our program. It's where are you currently in your journey? What are you interested in accomplishing? Here are some ways that we can do that for you. And here's that. Here's what that looks like for you going through this continuum or, or electing to participate in these services. Um, so the opera and then so we talk about no wrong door depending on where people come, then we can introduce them to additional services based on where they are uh, and what they might be interested in. Great, thank hey, you. Daryl, so if I could add just one piece to that too, from the operational standpoint in housing, we create a housing plan. 
for the people that are referred to us. So we're going to talk about what are your goals? What are your resources? You know, that could be financial. That could be, do I want to live close to my job? Do I want to live somewhere? Do I want to start over? I can't go back to that community that I was in. I, I need a, a fresh start somewhere else. So we're going to create a plan that's client centered based on what they want to do. And then we're going to bring that plan back up and help work through processes to, to get to the end goal of that. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, let's go to, I want to make sure we have time for folks to do the evaluation. Um, let's go to this question. And this again is for anyone. Can you describe your program's process for coordinating care across systems? Um, I could just talk quickly about, um, you know, sort of the logistics of creating MOUs, memorandums of understanding with all the partners, um, sort of a sort of have a template and then let the partners um, customize it based on the nature of the relationship. Um, and then, you know, what we have found in this sort of navigation model is to be co-located has been super helpful in terms of coordinating care. Um, both so so they almost so like the Jefferson Center for Mental Health and Stride Community Health, which is a local FQHC, they actually set up shop in our navigation center. So they're literally bringing their system into the one stop shop. Great, thank you so much, James. Um, I think we have time for one more. Um, how do you, again, this is for everyone, how do you incorporate culturally responsive practices throughout your programming? I think, I think for uh, Aspire that begins with, um, you know, the hiring practices and some of the, uh, you know, some of the values in our organization. It's a very diverse organization. Um, you know, so we have, uh, you know, a, a variety of different ethnic groups represented in our, in our staff, um, you know, the LGBTQ community represented. So as we look at uh, some of the, the responsive practices and begin to do work around DEI and serving, you know, uh, diverse populations, well, we have to look like the people we serve you know, and have that capability. So that's a component of those things. Um, and then along with that, we have a chief cultural officer uh, that brings program specific work to us and challenges us uh, in certain areas. Um, and so, you know, I don't think unless you measure things, uh, they don't get paid attention to. And if you're not talking about them, they're not top of mind, then it's just kind of a nice to have, or maybe we'll get around to it. And so these all become part of uh, our work, our strategic work, and then operationalizing that as we go through. So those are just some high level comments. And I, I don't think until those things are done as a foundation, you can really do that effectively. Great, thank you so much. Um, let's go to the next slide. So I know we didn't get to all the questions today. I know there was a lot of information. Um, so if you do have an additional question, um, you can submit a question to HHRC and um, using the link in the slides and under subject, just please indicate HUD SNOFO grant ETA question and that will go to Rachel and I and we can follow up with you to give you more information about anything that was presented today. Um, and please, if you could take the time to also fill out the evaluation, it helps us know how we can shift things and better meet the needs of the folks that are listening today. Um, and I just want to, again, thank our presenters. Um, we really appreciate your time. And I think that about wraps it up. Unless folks wanna put any questions in the chat, we may have time for one, but otherwise submit them through the portal like you're instructed to on the slide, which will be sent to the folks that attended today. Thank you, everyone. And, and Teresa, what's up for next week? Oh, next week, yes. Next week we have session four um, and it's about increasing access to treatment, harm reduction in recovery community organizations. Um, so we'll go through some strategies about what you can do in-house or how you can partner to build those um, areas you're programming up including you know, overdose prevention, access to harm reduction supplies, access to community partnerships with recovery care organizations. Um, 
a bunch of stuff. So we hope that you'll join us. We'll have a guest presenter who has done some work himself on expanding the reach of harm reduction um, by using safer smoking supplies. We really hope you'll join. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.